Welcome to our conversation. My name is Brian. Today I have with me uh, Dale Norwood. Um, he is a professor here at Binghamton. Um, welcome, Dale. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank yes. you. Um, so could you elaborate on the classes you teach here at Binghamton? Sure. So uh, I'm a historian of early America, um, which means uh, the 18th and 19th century is my specialty. And classes I teach here are on um, the early history of the United States. Um, and uh, Branching out from that, I'm particularly interested in the kinds of classes I've taught are on the history of uh, the economy, the history of capitalism, um, and the history of Americans' interactions with the rest of the world. So the kinds of classes I've taught already have been uh, a course called The U.S. and the World, uh, where we explored U.S. foreign relations up to 1900, so that, that early history again. Um, and next fall, I'm looking to teach the history of American capitalism. Uh, as well as the history surveys and, and various grad classes on, on those kinds of topics. That's very interesting. Um, you know, always looking into the future, it's always smart to look at our past. Um, and capitalism definitely has defined America. Hmm. Um, what would you say as a historian, the top things that really define America as you see it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I deal with the early part of American history, right? So, so this is going to be my, my particular focus on things. So. Um, I think slavery is a really important and defining aspect of American history that continues to affect our present, um, informing um, hierarchies of race and uh, racist ideas, racism as, as institutionally structured, um, but also as developing the resources of the country. Slavery is instrumental in creating the kind of economic system uh, and creating the, uh, the, the flows of capital that make later, um, later industrialization possible. Cotton, for example, is key to the development of the textile industry in the United States. That's the first wave of industrialization. So slavery and capitalism are intimately connected in that regard. Um, I think, kind of going in a slightly different direction, the United States has always been, and Americans have always been, people who worked out their destiny, and worked out what they were about in a world, uh, in, in a global world. That is to say, sometimes we think of the United States as uh, only developing in North America, or only being English colonies, or, or maybe looking towards the Atlantic coast, but nothing beyond that. Um, but if you, the more you get into the history, the more you, you realize that from the founding fathers on, mm -hmm. Americans are deeply concerned with events happening all around the world, mm -hmm. and see themselves as uh, uh, participating in that global society. Uh, they have different ideas about it, um, um, some good, some bad, uh, but this idea that we're in a new age where globalization is completely new, or this, this idea that this is there's new connections that we've never experienced before, mm -hmm. that doesn't quite ring true with, with earlier experiences in American history. That's very interesting. Um, considering that, you know, from my perspective, um, uh, I think of the American awakening in terms of the international perspective mm -hmm. uh, in World War II, mm -hmm. when Japan hit Pearl Harbor. And I think that's when, it's when the sleeping giant, quote unquote, was awoken. Mm. And I think that's when I think people perceive America to be international. Um, and America is defined today as the world police, as the world superpower. Mm. Um, but your interpretation rings true in the sense that you've had that history. Um, and so going forward, uh, you're, you're currently um, in works with a book, um, mm -hmm. and it deals with trade, and it deals with international relations. Mm -hmm. Um, so what would you say is the state of our current, um, of our current international system? Um, oh, <laughs> that's a really big question. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and give a, a, a little bit of a, my historical perspective on it and, yes. and leave maybe the, 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 the international politics as it is to, to other experts. But, so that's very interesting that you said it's a, it's a, it's a, a sleeping giant awakes. And I think, mm -hmm. I think you're right to look at the World War, uh, World War II or the mid 20th century as this, this new era in American history of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, being a world hegemon or a superpower. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think what, if you look at earlier er eras of the United States um, and their connections to the rest of the world, either as a nation in mm -hmm. a world of states or as mm -hmm. Americans as individuals, mm -hmm. what's notable is Americans' belief in that their, in their country's uh, ability to become a world power at some point, but mm -hmm. their awareness that it is not yet. Oh. Um, this is particularly true for the area I study, the, the period I study, um, the, the 19th century, mm -hmm. where Americans, um, are often speak about the possibilities they see for the development of the country, either as it, as it takes territory and moves west, mm -hmm. or as, uh, as it industrializes, as mm -hmm. the population grows. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very aware that they're weak in, um, uh, in terms of uh, overall military strength mm -hmm. or, or economic power. Yeah. Um, and they, they, they triangulate their position in the world mm -hmm. relative to Great Britain, mm 
So the British Empire plays an enormous role in, in structuring how Americans see themselves and, and where they see themselves being able to go and what they're able to do. And sometimes it's a cooperative thing. Mm -hmm. So Americans trade in China, mm -hmm. for example, which is my particular area of research, is uh, Americans there are deeply intertwined with British capital networks, with British credit, um, mm -hmm. Uh, the British community in, in China, which is much more powerful mm -hmm. uh, and much larger than the American community. So it's kind of cooperative, but it's also competitive. They're competing mm -hmm. um, to sell opium and buy tea, specifically, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and feed the same markets. Mm -hmm. In the same way that uh, a lot of Americans' foreign policy maneuvers in the 19th century mm -hmm. have to do with where they think Britain is and what Britain's going to do, mm -hmm. um, as well as other European and, and Asian and uh, mm -hmm. Latin American powers. But So that awareness of weakness mm -hmm. in you know, I, I wouldn't want to lean too hard on this uh, as an argument, as again, I'm not a specialist in contemporary politics, yeah. but some of the concern we see today about um, moving from a world of superpowers or a world where the United States is the superpower, singular, mm -hmm. to a world that's multipolar, yes. um, that's in many ways return to the position mm -hmm. uh, that Americans felt themselves to be in immediately after the revolution for another 150 years mm -hmm. after that, mm -hmm. um, where they were one power and a minor power, that among many, um, and they had uh, they had to triangulate. They had to work within that, and that led them to different decisions than a superpower makes. So I think that's that's partly how I read mm -hmm. contemporary politics through that. Is that this is not again, you know, historians like to say this it, two things: mm -hmm. uh, uh, nothing is new, uh, yeah. <laughs> and everything is complicated. Yes. Um, but I would see that this is kind of a return to the structure of politics that we've seen before. That's very interesting. Now, keeping with that, um, nothing is new, and uh, okay. everything is complicated. Okay. Um, yeah, when you take a look at today, um, in terms of jobs and other social issues, um, mm -hmm. when you look at the template that um, developing nations are taking, mm -hmm. you look at the low wages, you look at the, for example, you have Walmart, you have all these companies, um, they, they flock to these countries. And if you look back into the Industrial Revolution, you know, the workforce was really, the conditions were really bad. Mm -hmm. And having cheap labor and having this industrialization eventually made America a superpower. So in your interpretation, do you think that, in a way, the world is copying America's model of, again, having cheap labor, um, producing more? And would you say that this model could be improved? It could obviously be improved in terms of environmental safety and um, regulations. Um, so do you see any similarities of how, um, in the past, um, because America was so agile, because government, there was less government, um, do you see other nations using the industrial model, and um, and how does it affect, uh, what is the effect of it? Yeah, I would say a couple things to that. So one, the, the model you're laying out um, of a certain kind of industrialization, industrialization that's dependent on cheap labor, which means abuses mm -hmm. of workers. Um, I think I think it's interesting that sometimes we think of economic history as, as flowing, and particularly development, as flowing within particular stages. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's important, it's important to recognize that we're putting those stages on the past. We're, our interpretation is what is forcing that into, it's, it's our model that is letting us see these kinds of histories. So there's, a, there's alternate ways of looking at it. So, so you could look at the development of the United States' as economy as uh, primarily an extractive economy. It's, the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not industrialization that provides the capital that leads to, leads to greater wealth. It's, um, it's, it's large scale extractive in industries and uh, natural resources that uh, Americans are able to uh, draw from. And that can be agriculture as well as mining and things like that. So, so for a very long time, the, and actually still today, the chief exports in the United States are agricultural or uh, uh, natural resources of other kinds, oil or, or minerals and things like that. Um, and that's a very different basis than, than intensive development we see with industrialization. Um, but also industrialization doesn't necessarily have to follow one model. Um, um, and certainly, uh, uh, depending on, on how you think capitalism works or, 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 or development, which can be two different things, right? Because there's, there's industrialized powers that were not capitalist, the yeah. USSR and such. Um, development doesn't have to follow one path. So that replication of what we imagine America to be um, and, and, and how, we, how we imagine these other countries uh, working doesn't necessarily flow. So and, and one area that I think is particularly interesting is, so you said this, this idea, and it was a very common one, that uh, the 19th century saw, and or early years of American history, saw uh, government was small, government was out of the way, government was agile, and that's simply not true in many regards. Um, so that what we understand to be the federal regulatory state, um, so the federal government is quite large now, yeah. that has changed. But overall levels of government, um, uh, depending on how you measure it, 
um, have not changed that much. Um, so it depends where the taxes lie and who's doing the regulation. State governments, um, and this goes back to the American Revolution, state governments for, for a very long time uh, seen as the primary repository of government. And that was for political reasons, and uh, political theoretical reasons. Um, uh, early Republicans, small are George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, yes. that kind of folks. Um, imagine state governments as more responsive to the people. And so they could be entrusted with more powers. And so you'd see health regulations, regulations of employment, internal taxes, direct taxes, income taxes, those would happen at the state level. Uh, whereas the federal government was mainly focused on international policy um, and, and very big level things. So there's, there's, there's sometimes a, a United States bank, but that's really to manage accounts for the United States government. That's not really to, to control policy. The states did that. Um, so this idea that regulation was lighter or the state wasn't existing, the state in like the capital S sense, um, um, it really doesn't hold up depending on how you're looking at these regulations. Now these have changed, yes. um, but certainly saying the burden of government was not there, there wasn't regulation, that's not true. Although, as you're right to point out, working conditions were very poor. Um, and in part that is a reflection of um, power relations. The people who own the factories uh, were able to, to write things in their interests more often. And it took workers striking and work labor actions, decades and decades of them, um, to, to capture government enough to lead to protections. So these are all, and this is, not to keep going, not to totally yeah. filibuster you here, but um, yeah. this is why I, I, I describe myself as neither a political historian nor an economic historian, but yeah. a historian of political economy. That okay. is to say, a historian who looks at how people's ideas about politics and the economy as they're put together yes. uh, uh, evolved over time and, and, and tensions and changes in them and things. In some ways, that's an incredibly old-fashioned way to do things. That's a pretty strong way of looking at it, and um, you know, people always want to get the best economic and social model. Sure. And um, you know, you having um, uh, knowledge of China, um, some people say today that China has the best model mm -hmm. in a sense that the government is communist, but the economic system, as you can see, is shifting mm -hmm. to be more capitalist. Mm -hmm. So the state is able to find its resources, and one of the problems with America is sort of um, paralysis with over analysis meaning that there's too much bureaucracy. Um, so if we, in the historical context, we go back to, let's say, the Roaring Twenties, where uh, you saw American wealth you know, um, increasing, um, would you say that innovation um, and not so government really helped America grow? Um, no, <laughs> I wouldn't. And actually, the Twenties are a really good example. And again, I'm, I'm speaking a little beyond my purview here mm -hmm. um, as a specialist, but the Twenties saw economic growth, it's true, but then in a massive financial collapse that um, set in motion a, a, a very large and disruptive world war, mm -hmm. speaking very broadly. So if our model is the 1920s, then we're in some real trouble, oh. uh, right? Because yeah. they, they end with a crash and then a bang. That is true. Um, uh, yes. So, um, but I think, I think more generally this, this idea of, 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 of uh, innovation and disruption is the other kind of buzzword for it. Yes. You know, um, capitalism is a system that um, um, doesn't necessarily lead to better outcomes for human beings, even if it's, even as it's creating wealth. So, one of the disputes, or, or one of the trends in 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 my field and in, in the field of history of capitalism more generally, is uh, historians are more interested in investigating these moments where financial capital uh, caused change or led to change. So, slavery is another good example of this. We might have understood slavery. Um, as a system that was anti-capitalist, and many historians have made this argument that slavery is its ownership of people um, and property in people, and that means that it's more akin to something feudal. Mm -hmm. um, and planters certainly talked this way in the 1840s and 50s. They talk about their family. Mm -hmm. They talk about um, being their, their yeah. enslaved people. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, when, if we look at the way they acted and how the economies of slavery worked, mm -hmm. these are planters who are almost to a person heavily indebted. Mm -hmm. um, they're dependent on credit networks, which means that they're dependent effectively on Wall Street in the end, mm -hmm. or really on London. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, to give them credit, to not allow them to expand mm -hmm. um, um, their holdings and bring more land under cultivation, mm -hmm. creating a commodity that is then placed on an international market. Mm -hmm. So they're basically the same kind, of, um, um, uh, same kind of structures that we see today in many regards in terms of the booms and bust cycles, right? Uh, yeah. um, and that's an era where, um, where you know, government intervention in the economy mm -hmm. While I would say regulation is there and the state is still as heavy, government yes. regulation in, in terms of smoothing and that bureaucracy you were talking about yes. is light. Mm -hmm. There's no national bank, mm -hmm. um, but it's still a highly capitalist system, and it's and it's the ownership of people. It's a horrible system. Yeah. So, so I think we want to be careful with these dichotomies where we say bureaucracy bad, yeah. innovation and disruption good, uh -huh. because some of those cycles mm -hmm. and 
uh, uh, end in levels of exploitation that we, anyone would find unacceptable today. Now, speaking of cycles, um, I think uh, the economy um, has does go up and down. Sure. And um, with taking in the effect, um, I believe it was in the 1900s, the, um, the Federal Reserve. Mm. Um, what do you think their role is? And you know, certain people have a lot of business expertise, but um, in a way to sort of tame capitalism, mm. and knowing that capitalism itself, you know, is sort of like a wild bull. Um, this invisible hand, our own self-interest, will work if we're all rational agents. But we are all irrational. We make irrational decisions. So I think the beast that is capitalism, I, I don't think any economy, even our own history, is purely capitalism. Um, would you say that um, we are sort of like a hybrid? And again, going back uh, to Roosevelt, um, having social programs, so in a sense, Medicare, Medicaid, um, welfare programs, to understand that the risk that people individually can get immense amount of wealth because of their own individual will or their own individual luck. But as a consequence, you're going to have winners and losers. Um, and to really have a society where, um, where people can have more opportunity, that there does need that this capitalism that we interpret, um, that let's say Republicans or other um, anti-government uh, individuals see that we have needs to be more capitalistic, would you say that in, in a sense we need more of a hybrid uh, system? Yeah, uh, so you're right, this is venturing far beyond my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, okay. uh, uh, but uh, I think one of the things that, this is, this is maybe where studying the past can, can be a help to us to thinking through these issues. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in the early 19th century, historians describe a transition to uh, a more individualistic society, a society that is more, in, in the United States, that is more oriented towards participating in the market. Uh, people are selling their labor, people are buying in the market, the market is the thing that they are transacting their lives through. And, and this is how we live today, right? Um, um, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard to go a day without buying something, either food or you're paying your rent, or um, you're not, you're not, Producing things and living outside the market. So historians call this the, the, the their term for this transition mm -hmm. from um, uh, uh, systems where people are not participating in the market to one where almost everyone is the market revolution. Mm -hmm. And part of one of the things that happens along with that trend happens in the same decades mm -hmm. is a is a radical reorientation of politics. Mm -hmm. um, it goes from from kind of a, 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 there are leaders and they are, uh, there's there's an upper class that that we give deference to, and, and, and elections are de decorous things, mm -hmm. to Jacksonian mm -hmm. democracy, which is wild mm -hmm. um, and populist and terribly scary to a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, but leads to a, a political system that is, is much more freewheeling and much more mm -hmm. open elections and, and contested, like mm -hmm. we understand now. Um, and I think, I think part, of that, part of that change, mm -hmm. people get swept up in a system where they feel they don't have control. And so they look to politics um, to gain control. Mm -hmm. um, and so with Jacksonian democracy, you have a couple different things cutting against each other. Um, part of the criticism that Jackson and his, his party make of the existing system is that it's too cronyist. Mm -hmm. um, the people in power are just going out and getting for them. Mm -hmm. And there's not enough for us. We're working in the system, and we're all individuals, but we need to group together as men. Mm -hmm. And they would use these masculine, and they would, it was a mm -hmm. uh, white man is what they're talking about here. Yeah. This, is not a, this is not an open race kind mm -hmm. of situation. Um, we need to get there as men to create a system where everyone can have a fair shot. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes an ideology that is still with us, this idea of everybody, everybody gets an opportunity to become very wealthy, no one gets an advantage necessarily the, over other people. But it's interesting that in the 1830s and the 1840s, the politics there were we need to use politics to make sure that that's possible, mm -hmm. whereas now the discussion is quite different. We need to get out of politics to make sure that's possible. So I think that's, that's, that's a good illustration of these kind of arguments that we're having kind of discussions, yes. um, the order in which you see a, a, the economy as being the most natural, or mm -hmm. political organization being the most natural, mm -hmm. that can switch, and has switched multiple times. Okay. Um, and so I think that's interesting to kind of keep that in mind as we have these, these discussions. Interesting. So um, now going back to your book, uh, your expertise, sure. um, what are some just general themes throughout the book, and, and what are some points that um, you think viewers should know? Sure. So I'm writing a book about um, American trade with China. Uh, the first uh, 80 to 100 years of it. Um, I start with the first American trading voyage to China, which leaves New York Harbor on Washington's birthday in 1784. So right after the revolution, the first thing that these merchants decide to do is let's go sail to China. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I'm closing with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Acts in the mm -hmm. 1880s. Um, and what I'm looking at there is how Americans 
projected ideas and worked out ideas about what they thought their nation should be and how it should work in their international trade. <clears throat> um, so that early voyage, uh, Americans see themselves excluded now that they've revolted from Britain. They see themselves excluded from British markets. Mm -hmm. They're looking for opportunity. They think China, mm -hmm. a far Asian power, that they don't have to have any political connections with. They don't have to enter into alliances. Mm -hmm. They can just trade. They see trade as the thing that they want to do, and they'll handle their own affairs at home. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't work out that way. Trade involves you in politics. Mm -hmm. They get involved in the Opium War. They get involved in sending missionaries. They get involved in sending mm -hmm. gunships to, to protect American interests there. Um, and eventually, it leads to a situation where there's Chinese uh, people moving to America for work, to build railroads, to engage in mining. Mm -hmm. uh, and that creates a political problem for Americans at home. They see it as a new kind of slavery. Um, uh, or they see that this, these people coming over, they're regarding them as, um, as no better than slaves. So it's actually a kind of a racist, a kind of, it's a racist orientation of the Chinese once their economic value is done. And that changes the politics of the United mm -hmm. States. So, so I guess the themes here are how Americans when they look to trade, yes. which is supposed to be this non-political thing, mm -hmm. when they look to trade, how does politics inform that mm -hmm. and alter that? And then how does trade create political problems for Americans? Mm -hmm. and in the 1870s and the 1880s, the political problem for white Americans is how do we maintain a white republic now that slavery is gone? Mm -hmm. We have to construct new racial hierarchies, or, or, or some of them argue that. Some of them say we should have no racial hierarchies, and that's the debate. Mm -hmm. They end up going for Chinese exclusion and segregation laws in the South and create a new racial hierarchy that's not based in ownership of people, mm -hmm. but denying people certain races, certain access. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal, that's a big change. And it happens in this global environment. Mm -hmm. It's not just about African Americans, it's also about Asian Americans. I know many Asians worked on uh, railroads, mm -hmm. and I also know that, um, or I think I know that, um, there are also some mistreatments. I know that certain times they could be killed when they're blowing up dynamite. They were the people that most likely would go into bad areas, just as, for example, African Americans will be the people to go in the front line. So it's very interesting that sometimes we forget that you know we do have a deeper history with uh, with Asian Americans. Um, now, in terms of China itself, um, uh, we spoke before the show. Um, I always think of the Chinese awakening with Kissinger. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if this is your expertise, but um, uh, what's interesting um, is that we have so much history before Kissinger. What do you think are some elements that allowed us to have such a good relationship with China? You know, today everything is made in China. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people might believe that Kissinger and his administration was a magician. But I think that we had, there was some um, infrastructure already there. Um, so could you elaborate on some of the infrastructure and relationships that existed that allowed us to have this current relationship? Sure, yeah. So the Nixon administration and Kissinger. Um, uh, Richard Nixon would be very upset with you that you give Henry all the credit. But uh, uh, so, so the opening of the opening, the reopening of relations with China a after the Communist Revolution. So, so um, is a very interesting thing. Um, um, in some ways, I think that what uh, Nixon and Kissinger were working against is that past relationship with America that had been relatively close compared to other powers. So, so um, Americans, when they're in China, when they're trading in China, in the 18th and 19th centuries and into the 20th century, they see themselves as. Uh, and particularly this is true of politicians and diplomats, they see themselves as um, offering an alternative uh, uh, to European imperialism, mm -hmm. and particularly British imperialism. Mm -hmm. um, so you get these early moments, um, the first treaty with China that the Americans signed in 1844, very early on, wow. it's in the wake of the Opium War, which is Britain's invasion of the China coast to enforce their right to sell opium to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Americans are also big opium dealers. They claim not to be. Mm -hmm. And when they, um, they're smaller time than the British. Mm -hmm. um, and the Chinese, uh, in order to get an agreement with them, choose to accept that, 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 that white line. Mm -hmm. um, and Americans perceive this treaty and define themselves to the Chinese as, hey, mm -hmm. we also had to fight the British. We also fight British imperialism. We're with you. Mm -hmm. We believe that sovereignty should be, the national sovereignty should be inviolable. Mm -hmm. um, there shouldn't be a market, uh, in, in, in some ways what the British are doing are forcing the Chinese market open. It's, a, it's a kind of an opening, it's like a, it's, it's, it's using uh, ideas about the liberal economy and saying we should back these up with force because it's in the end better for everybody if we have open markets. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe us, we're going to bomb your fortresses. Um, Americans go to the Chinese and say, hey, you know, we, if you're open, we want a place at the table, but we're not going to use force. And that's the line they maintain until the communist revolution. They see themselves in a, uh, as an alternative to um, um, European imperialism in China. And so you get this at the end of the 19th century, you get John Hay and this, this idea of uh, the open door policy. So, so Americans just want an open door. They want everybody to have the ability to trade in China mm -hmm. and protect Chinese sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, 
that said, that support of uh, opium dealers for, for one side of things, but also the, um, the Manchu or the Qing dynasty, which is the dynasty that the communists uh, helped to overthrow um, in the 20th century, um, is not something that wins you points if you're, <laughs> if you're a communist power. So, uh, and Americans during the early 20th century um, had supported uh, the non-communist anti-Qing faction, the Republicans, um, who are who now who eventually retreated to, to Taiwan. And we're getting beyond my expertise here, so I apologize to any yeah. Chinese historians who are watching. But that kind of support for a non-communist faction made things very difficult, uh, military support as well, uh, for a non-communist faction made things very difficult after World War II is over. Interesting. Now, um, throughout this talk, there's been themes of really inequality. Mm. And um, I think as historians, um, you as a historian, um, there, there are certain things that repeat itself. Um, now, you have a very interesting uh, connection to um, uh, the play Hamilton. You know? oh, yeah. um, <laughs> very slight I, connection, I suppose. Very slight yeah. connection. <laughs> and um, um, what's the person's name again? Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Yeah, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, he's the hot thing right now in Broadway. Sure. And, um, so. One of the things I admire with him is that he's able to tell history in a modern sense. Mm, mm -hmm. And I think the beauty of Binghamton, and I think what, um, what I think you and other professors um, are trying to do is to really tell history in a different way. Um, and what are some ways um, that you think, or what are some um, ways that uh, you think Hamilton, um, what they have done to really modernize mm. history? Uh, and what are some other ways you think in Binghamton that um, history could be taught or history could be different? To get out that special message. Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's one that we think about a lot in, in the history department. So, so with regard to Hamilton, what I think is really interesting about that show is that it's um, Lin Manuel Miranda. My slight connection for the viewers is that I went to the same college as he did. Um, uh, so slight, but um, and I'm an early American historian, so I'm excited yeah. about Alexander Hamilton. But his his part of his genius, and this is widely remarked, is that he's taken uh, a story of a dead white male, right, and not just any dead white male, the guy that was on the conservative Wall Street side of politics um, and made and, and, and retold the story with a diverse cast and with uh, a hip hop and as well as a Broadway sensibility. So the music is new music um, and he's emphasizing things like that Hamilton was an immigrant, which is, cert which is true um, and, and, and something we'd overlooked before. Um, but the show is as much based in modern uh, contemporary musical forms as it is rooted in recent history recent historiographical work. So, for example, all the, the parts that they have musical that are about dueling mm -hmm. um, are based on a work by a mentor of mine, Joanne Freeman. She teaches at Yale. She wrote a great book mm -hmm. about dueling as a form of politics in American history. Mm -hmm. So we only hear about duels that got to the guns. Yeah. But it's actually, her argument is that it's actually part of a much longer thing. Uh, if you have a personal dispute with someone or a political dispute with someone, first you insult them. And if oh. they don't, if they accept the insult, then you move along. Mm -hmm. But if they retaliate and they demand a duel, then you, you have this intense negotiation, which is intended to make sure the duel doesn't happen. Wow. So the fact that it gets to a duel means everyone's failed. Mm -hmm. And that's based on uh, Joanne's research. So Lynn is reading these things, and, and, um, um, and he's very clear about his influences. It's mainly based on a biography by Ron Chernow, but, but all of his emphasis on Eliza and how women act in the revolution, that's all based on cutting edge scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting, and I think that um, a lot of the times that people who only had history at a, at a, at a, at a high school class, or no, I don't want to yeah. uh, dump on, on high school teachers or anything, but if they, if they think about it as something that's dead, mm -hmm. I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's uh, taking a history class at Binghamton, and, and what I and my colleagues try to do is to, is to showcase how history is a conversation. It's an argument. It's a really vicious, bitter, interesting, engaging, bloody argument mm -hmm. uh, without end. Um, so history as a mode of thinking is a history of way of arguing with evidence, and historians are engaged in this conversation. And, and so what I look to do in my classes is to make that open up that conversation and make it comprehensible to our students. Um, and I think once you do that, then they start getting engaged in the same way that Manuel uh, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda has opened up Hamilton's history and made it comprehensible. Um, so some of the things I do are shtick, I, I'll admit. Um, in my classes, I like to use pop music oh. as thematic ties. So wow. we've, we've just finished the revolution in my history survey class. Mm -hmm. For me, the revolution is all about Taylor Swift because it's all about breaking up, <laughs> yeah. right? Very nice. <laughs> so, but there's different ways to do it. But I think if you think of it as a conversation that you, as a scholar, as a student, have, can have purchase in and get, get involved in that argument, that's the exciting thing, I think. That is very exciting. Well, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much. All it's right. been a pleasure. See you next time. Bye.